Welcome to episode 297 of Grid Talk. Today we're here to preview the 2023 Austrian Grand Prix. My name is Ruby Price and joining me we have Grid Talk co-host George Housen. Good afternoon. And Tom Downey. Hey. And from AHGP and a regular on the show, Aaron Harper. Hello everybody. Before we get into the episode, we must thank our sponsor for this episode, Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting needs. Get the latest odds, lines, and matchup reports for baseball, boxing, golf, and more. Bet Online continues to be the fastest and easiest way to place your wages, including live betting from your favorite casino and card games. Available to play right from your phone. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and get in on the action. Remember to use their promo code BLEAV, B L E A V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online where the game starts. But first, if you enjoy this podcast, we would love it if you could take five to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're one of the 72% of people who aren't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider helping us out with a like and a subscribe. So the big news this week comes from our own Grid Talk camp, as we have announced the first ever Grid Talk Live. We'll be hosting a watch along of the Austrian Grand Prix and then recording a live podcast after the race is finished. In attendance will be myself and Grid Talk co-host George Housen, Tom Downey, Owen Medford and Sophia Richmond. And if you want to come along, that will be taking place on Sunday the 2nd of July at the Seven Oaks in Manchester, M1 4HL. If you can make it down, please do. But if you can't we will be streaming the show as normal so looking ahead to the race weekend then it's a one horse race for the championship and if max verstappen was a constructor he'd be leading that as well ahead of both aston martin and ferrari heading into red bull's home race where the dutchman has delivered so consistently in recent years can anything stop the charging red bull driver other than the threat of reliability we also see the return of the sprint format and shaking up the proceedings we have a single practice session and then a qualifying session on the friday to set the odds for the race on sunday and on saturday being exclusively about the sprint we will have a sprint qualifying which then sets the uh, grid for saturday sprint race george first of all i want to come to you for your thoughts on the sprint weekend format we saw it used for the first time in baku this season is this the right direction for f1 if it's going to insist on including the sprint weekends i'm not sure i'm not so sure Ruby. to be honest i mean um i'm a bit indifferent to the way they've changed uh the weekend i mean i think at least, you know, at least this time we're going into the weekend actually knowing what's going on because <laughs> obviously for Baku, it was announced on like Thursday or something right before the race. As usual, Formula One with impeccable timing there. Fantastic. Not that they had four weeks to uh, to plan that one in advance. But yeah, I'm a bit indifferent to it, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't personally see the value in having the sprint weekend in Austria. I think it's better around circuits where we're more likely to see some, some craziness like Azerbaijan, like Brazil. Like Monza to an extent as well. I don't really see much value in having it in Austria as well. I do like the theory that having one practice session shakes things up. Um, I'm not a fan of the sprint qualifying though. And I wasn't on a show for the the Azerbaijan weekend, but I did express um, some big concerns regarding with that track anyway, how drivers would be um, very very pressed for time and they'd be just because of the long flat out zone to the, to the first corner um, we could have had an almighty pile up and thank God that didn't happen. But I honestly thought that really could have happened, especially with some of the stuff we've seen at Monza over the years with the guys queuing up around the final corner. So I'm a bit indifferent to it, to be honest with you. I mean, more racing is always good, but like we always, uh, like we said before the show started, we've also got Formula 2 and Formula 3 this weekend. I mean, personally, I think it's going to be a very exhausting weekend for, for everybody involved, including the fans. There's going to be so much going on that um that these that some people might not even know what is going on, you know, but kind of get lost with that one. So not a huge fan of it, I'll be honest. Um, but I'm interested to see what it produces this weekend. Yeah, and if you do want to catch up on what has happened in F2 and F3, you can listen to our sister podcast, Formula Talk, hosted by our you know resident Tom Downey and Sophia. Um, Aaron, we saw during the last sprint teams not actually being able to run during sessions because they had no new sets of tyres that were mandatory to use in those sessions. This rule is being carried over and in the sprint shootout qualifying this weekend, teams must use brand new mediums in sprint quality one and two and switching to brand new softs of sprint quality three. With all this in mind, will tyre strategy be paramount in Austria? Austria. <laughs> Easy mistake to make. Um 
Yeah, oh, it's difficult to say because it's not really a circuit that stresses tires a huge amount, but the the expectation that they have to use brand new mediums in uh, SQ1 and 2 and then brand new softs in SQ3 is an interesting one because we saw Sonoda and Norris be left up the creek without a paddle, to use a phrase, because they, they'd used the softs in practice one, which was a bit of a silly thing to do. And then they ended up getting through to Q3 on the Friday night. So you have to forward plan. And if you know you need a brand new set, you've got to make sure you set a set, set a set aside um, to sort of make sure you, you've got some when you get there. It is a little bit silly, I think, in the terms of that they're forcing them to use those tires, brand new tires there in, in that part of the session. But then I think that's down to the fact that the, the design of that sprint shootout session isn't really appropriate it's just a shortened rerun of what we had on the friday so in theory you should get almost exactly the same order and in in baku we did we put, we got charles leclerc on pole on both occasions so i wouldn't be surprised to see whoever is on the front row at least on the front two rows on both races so i think that's where they need to look at is actually how that session is run to set up the grid for the sprint and then you know it'll, it'll work itself out from there but let's be honest there is a tried and tested sprint format in formula two and formula three where you just reverse the grid and you know max verstappen won't be grumpy because he's got to do another qualifying session so everybody's a winner yeah and it is also worth noting uh thanks to tom danny uh tire allocations had already been had already taken place before the sprint quality was even announced in baku so you know that was another thing that mclaren obviously fell foul of um finally on the sprints then tom after austria our next sprints are belgium qatar kota and brazil if f1 is to add more sprints to this calendar as we believe the intention is where else would you like to see sprint weekends feature I'd like to see them in the bin, to be honest. Um, I that's about as much as they add to F one. Um, it's it, it's like I get that the point of sprints is, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm being honest. I, I I don't want to see any more of them. I don't want to be I don't want to be one of those old. Oh no, kick the man, kick the man, I'm all for innovation, and I'm all for um, trying out new things, but. We have sprints in other categories, such as F3, F2, uh, you, you know, we have like, different grids in F1 Academy, things like that. But in, um, in, in, in F1, if, if you're not going to have a sprint that impacts the main race, what's the point? Because you know, cause, cause they first introduced a sprint in 2021 and said, it's not a race. Yeah, top three get points, but it's not a race. And then there's a whole confusion over who gets pole position. And then it's like you get pole in the Elim quality or in the sprints or, or whatever. And then it's like crosses the line, but he wins. But is he won a race or is he on pole? And it's like, you know, what day of the week it is? You know, who am I? Kind of thing. And I just don't think it adds anything. And that's why I don't, I, I just don't want to see any more races with it. If you can, if I find I'm going to do a sprint, have the kahunas to do a reverse pole because. That would spice it up. You know, yes, you know, if, if say for example, excuse me, um Max put it on pole, because let's be fair, it ain't gonna be Czech this year, is it? You know, maybe Alonso and perhaps one of the Mercs, um, you know, might might get on pole. Um uh, at some point. I I don't know where. But but you know, let let's say we had a race weekend where we had quality in a sprint on a Saturday, and we had the normal quality that we know. And Max put it on pole, and we then had the sprint, and then Quali set the grid for the sprint. We had the sprint, then Max starts on pole, sails off into the distance, finishes P1. That means he starts P8 or P10 the following day. It would at least give us something. It would throw a bit of jeopardy into there. And yes, F1 is a sport, but F1 is also entertainment. So, you know, it's, it, there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution, and... Another reason why it won't be as exciting as F2 or F3 is because F1 is not a spec series. 
you know. So you know, so you've got to factor that into it as well. But at the minute, it just feels like F1 is sort of just just clicking their finger, sticking it in there, and seeing what sticks. And at the minute, this sprint series is not sticking. It needs to sprint off. <laughs> it needs to sprint off. Um, strong words from Tom Downey there. But let's start looking at the, the constructors and their fortunes for this weekend. So George, it was another disappointing weekend for the Alpha Tauri team last time out, who are currently propping up the constructors in P10 with only two points, which both came from Sonoda, uh, who also had a nightmare in Austria last year with multiple penalties being handed out for crossing the white line on the pit entry. Do you think he's been in the simulator learning the entry line? Um, and do you think the struggling back markers have a chance this weekend? <laughs> Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's weird to describe Alvatari as backmarkers, but that is what they are. They are now behind Williams after uh, after Albon's incredible driving in Canada a couple of weeks ago. So, so yeah, they are the team at the bottom of the championship, which is is very weird to think. Um, they did have a bad year last year, of course, but this year they just seem to be even worse. Um, there is a bit of pace in that car, but unless they're going to bring some big upgrades since Canada, I I don't really see them troubling the points. Nick DeVries, I feel like the guy is a is, is a talented driver. He showed that last year, but maybe that was just a one-trick pony performance uh, more than anything at Monza, which might sound a bit harsh, I know, but we've not seen him on a full season apart from what's been going on recently. So I think he's talented, but in terms of his performances this year, the pressure is potentially starting to show, which I think is a damn shame, to be honest with you, but that's the Red Bull system. It's, uh, it's nothing new. Um Sonoda, I'd expect a better performance from him. Um, he's been better this year on the whole, I think, but his car's just letting him down. So I think unless we get a lot of retirements, it's going to be very difficult for them to score points this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be difficult for the team and it doesn't really look like there's going to be much for, well, much major fortune for them looking ahead. Um, but looking at Williams then, Aaron, who was sat in P9 after a determined Canadian drive from Alex Albon brought home a decent haul of points for the underperforming constructor. That's too many words in my sentence. Uh, not one of their strongest back uh, tracks, but the long straights. Perhaps it can play to the team straight line speed and build on last weekend's result. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking is going to be a bit of a coin flip as to how Williams do. You've got the the fast corners, the double left-hander in the in the middle sector, uh, and the two fast right-handers to close the lap. But the straight line speed of that Williams, they'll always have a fighting chance. And because it's such a short lap, you can't really escape if you're in similar speed machinery. So we're going to see a lot of DRS trains. If Albon gets track position, we've seen many times already that he's very, very good at what they do, what they call controlling the pack. So that's how he kept Ocon behind in an Alpine and, and Norris behind in Canada. So the skill's there. It's just whether they, they nail the setup and, and get things right and get that all-important track position because following has been more difficult this year. So even with three DRS zones, it's going to be a, a struggle to get through unless you've got a serious pace advantage. Um, and also for Albon, word of warning, you know, just be careful at like turn three, four, you know, don't let anyone up the inside there, because especially in Mercedes, don't don't let them get too close to you. I mean, we did see last year penalties handed out for the car up the inside at turn four. Um, you know, if that if there is a collision there, it does seem to be if you're on the inside, it's more likely to be your fault. But at the same time, we know you can't generally make a move stick around the outside of turn four, um, or at least Albon does now. Um, Haas, though, are currently just ahead in P8 with eight points. The American team have struggled with their Sunday race pace in recent weeks, though. Sandwiched between Williams and Alfa Romeo, Tom, should Haas be looking forward or behind this weekend in Austria? Um, good question. Uh, I think they'll do relatively well in quality because you know, I, th I think they'll have decent pace you know, given quick lap, not overly technical. Um, is is it is in this circuit, but uh, yeah, they they've got a rather large sort of disparity between their quality pace and their race pace, and you know I I, I think they are going to I, I think they'll have a decent quality. Maybe Hulk might sneak a top three. He ain't going to get a look. Hulkenberg's never going to get a podium. Just get over it, okay? Um, you know, and you know, and it, it's. It, 
I believe Haas in 2018 recorded their best ever race result here. I think they had P4 and P5 or P4 and P6 or something. Um, it was it was it was it was some, some, something like that, um, and, um, and yeah, it's just that this this twenty twenty three car they've got it's got pretty good one lap pace. We've we seen you know we saw it in you know, sort of Bahrain, you know, we saw it in we saw it last week, obviously in in the wet, so to speak. You know, it was, it was a little bit different, but generally they've been fairly strong in quality. Miami was another one with K Mac. Um, but yeah, the the race pace, especially given you know the, you know the, there's there's the DRS choo choo train. You know we've got three DRS zones, so there's a good chance that they're going to get caught in one of those, and likely be the car at the front which doesn't have DRS because they've fallen away from your front runner. So so your Max, your your Alonso, your Mercs, and probably the Ferraris provided signs doesn't try and spearfish anybody in qualifying, including the barriers. Um, odds are perhaps they're going to be held in that DRS train or they're, they're going to be saying tickets please at the front and once everybody sail past with the rear wings open and ultimately have a pretty naff result yeah staying with Haas George um, Tom touched on this a little bit they performed well here last season finishing P6 with Mick Schumacher's first points P8 with Magnussen Grosjean P4 the, um, in 2017 I think we said Um the question on everyone's minds is, have Haas fallen back? Is it the limited development that the team appear to um, do for their car? Or does the team sort of need a complete overhaul in order to try and get back to fighting for, you know, good points consistently? That's a very good question. And I don't really have the answer to it, to be honest with you. It's, it's very hard to say from the outside. Um I, mean, I look at the drivers, I look at Hulk and Magnussen, I like both of them. I like them both as people as well. Um, but in terms of their performance um, as a whole, their levels, it's like they are average by Formula One standards. And it pains me to say it, but it's true. Um, you look at a lot of the lineups for the drivers, uh, especially and especially the teams around them. You know, Williams have got Albon, who's been doing bits in that Williams Um Alfa Romeo, I mean, obviously, no Valtteri Bottas. He's not the absolute best driver, but he did hold his own at times against Lewis Hamilton in the same car. Um, and then, obviously, McLaren. I think McLaren have got an excellent lineup, but just terrible, terrible car at the moment. Um, but Haas, you know, I, I really don't know what they need. I mean, the amount of times they've flattered this, to deceive this season, especially Hulkenberg after his qualifying performances. I mean, before the penalty was applied, he was second in Canada on merit. I mean, yes, the conditions helped, of course, but he just he just mastered them, just like he did Brazil 13 years ago for his first pole position. So it's, he's no stranger to that. But then he ends up finishing 15th by the end of the race. Um, that car seems to be... Okay, well, sorry, no, pretty good in qualifying for where it should be. But in the race, it's just got absolutely nothing. I don't know if it's the setup. I don't know if it's the drivers. I don't know if it's the tyres or the conditions or bad luck or what. But it is just not working out for them. And uh, with with how Williams have been performing recently, I won't rule out Williams getting ahead of them if they're not already, to be honest with you. Um, and the same with Alpha Tauri. I mean, there's a very real possibility that Haas could be at the bottom of the constructors again before too long. So they need to they need to pick it up. Um, they've not scored any points since Miami, so it's been a little while. And in that time, the highest finish has been 15th. So they've not even been close to scoring points. So Haas are in some real danger. Historically, this is a better track for them, of course, but their very recent history is... Um, concerning to say the least yeah absolutely and i think everyone's touching it that qualifying pace might be there but you don't earn points on a friday qualifying or a saturday qualifying um but you can get them in a saturday sprint it's confusing you see uh aaron alfa romeo then are just ahead in p7 with nine points bottas taking the intra team lead uh with five ahead of joe's four um after just being picked to the finishing line in, in canada by lance stroll but after a relatively poor showing from bottas this season so far the good weekend in canada should hopefully see the finn return to better form uh I don't know. Since the middle of last year, Bartas has been like really up and down, but it's the, the car is not as competitive as it was. So he's he's got half a hand tied behind his back in that respect. But Joe has been much closer to his pace this year, 
which has surprised me um, in, a, in a good way because we want to see him do well. We don't, we don't want to see, not, not for a, to be negative about it, pay drivers come in and do badly. We want to see them show, actually, yes, they're, they're fully worth a seat on the grid. And Joe is showing that at the moment. So it's going to be difficult for Alfa Romeo, I think, because you don't know where their car is going to fall in terms of competitiveness. So how they get round practice one, and if they nail the setup, then they could be in business because the car is going to park firmly after that and you're kind of locked in. So if they do a good job there, then they should be all right. But again, it's it's not the most competitive car there's cars that are quicker that will get ahead of them. And yeah, they, they just, you never seem to quite know what you're going to get from, from them as a team. Yeah, absolutely. Consistency in Alfa Romeo is not, um, well, they are consistently inconsistent. I think we could say absolutely. McLaren then finished pointless again in Canada after a five second time penalty for unsportsmanlike behavior, uh, relegated Lando Norris from P9 to P13. Tom, they currently sit P6 with 17 points and are in relative no man's land, but they were strong in Austria with last year's car. What can Norris and teammate Oscar Piastri do this weekend? Um, well, Norris has gone pretty, you know, he's been pretty handy around here in the past. <laughs> I do ap- apologize. I was trying to stifle that. Um that's what that's one for the uh, that's one for the clip channel. Um yeah, no, um I I I do think I say I do think. I hope they can be alright around here because they didn't look too bad around Canada and it's a not too dissimilar kind of circuit, you know, in sort of fairly you know, you know long straights and you know, not not super intricate, so you know. But again, my fear is that the McLaren just looks fairly draggy even now. Um, you know, see so if, if they get stuck in a DRS train, yes, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna be able to um, you know, move up the grid a bit quicker. But then, on the flip side, everybody else around them is gonna have DRS probably aside from the hash before the back, like I said. Um, I just got a feeling they're gonna be stuck in no man's land this weekend, sort of like on the fringes of points. Um, but I think they'll probably miss out on Q3. Norris will probably out-qualify Piastri. Um, happy to be proven wrong, though, but by any stretch, because I think um, I think Piastri is the best or, or the most competitive teammate Norris has had um, in, in F1. Um, that's not hard really comparing against Danny Rick, is it? Uh, all those signs were decent. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, McLaren just needs to sort of get through this season and then sort of just go back to the drawing board for next year's car. So I, I think... They're probably pretty much at the stage where they've written off this season. They know that they're going to be like P5 in the structures, probably P6, depending on how other teams do around them. And yeah, they just they just need to just maybe just keep their nose clean into turn one because obviously a bunch is up quite a tight right hander, um, and then just just try and keep the pack. I'd say it's it's easier said than done, though, isn't it? I think with F1, everything is easier said than done. This is obviously the mo- the pinnacle of motorsport. Um, but firmly sat in P5 are Alpine with 44 points and so far a strong set of results for Ocon and Gasly. Um, but issues in qualifying have routinely seen Gasly in recovery mode during the race, generally starting from near the back. Uh, they were quick in Austria in 2022, George. Can you see their form continuing? It probably will, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tom said that McLaren are in no man's land. Uh, Alpine are definitely no man's land as well. Uh, they are well clear of McLaren behind them, uh, and they're absolutely nowhere near Ferrari ahead of them. Um, they're just the team that's kind of best of the rest, really. Uh, they're probably going to get low end of points. Um, like they do most races. It's not really much else to say about them, to be honest with you. Um, like like we always joke about on this on this channel. The most exciting thing that'll probably happen to Alpine is, is if the drivers are racing each other a bit too much. Um, but aside from that, it'll probably be a decent haul of points for them. I don't really see much else, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we did see them doing quite competitively around here last year. Um, although we did see, you know, a bit of finger wagging from former driver Fernando Alonso. And of course, um, you know, hopefully, well, we might see some inter team battles going on there. But let's have a look. Ferrari, 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 Ferrari. 
Austria 2022, Charles Leclerc's most recent race win a season ago. And that was his, you know, season for the championship. Um, but so far, an underperforming team have only mustered P4 with 122 points, Aaron. Um, a rare strategy success in Canada brought both drivers up the standings, um, finishing P4 and 5 last time out. Um, you know, what What do you see Ferrari doing this race, this sprint race weekend? Uh, there'll be a force in qualifying, but they'll probably fall back in the race. And you have to factor in reliability as well with Ferrari because their engines tend to go pop a bit more regularly than everybody else's. They'll probably forget to put tyres on the thing, uh, just listing all the different ways Ferrari can mess it up. Uh, tyres, fuel, they'll probably put, forget to put a driver in it at some point. Yeah, or they'll fit into on a dry track or something. They've all, they've done this all before, haven't they? Let's be honest. So, again, you... It's a, it's one of the Ferrari are one of those teams at the moment where you never quite know quite what they're going to do because they could do something very good or very very silly. And Sunday in Canada was one of those very good days because they got a strategy right and that they they timed their choices correctly. They got the the cars in the right position and secured the points they probably would have got had they started in the right position anyway. So I think they are probably fourth best overall in terms of speed and driver combination at the moment in terms of delivering the package Aston Martin are probably you know a bit further apart in what's being delivered but Alonso is making up the ground and Mercedes are, are getting their act together so Ferrari definitely have work to do and if they can have a strong Austrian weekend they can move themselves closer to Aston Martin for third place I think Mercedes might just run away with second considering the, the strength of their driver pairing and if Ferrari do get beaten by uh, Aston Martin with one and a half drivers delivering the requisite amount of points, um, then they need to have a serious look at themselves. And I, I I don't know what Fred Vasseur is really planning because, I mean, how much say does he have? This is the big question. And it's just been one catastrophe after another with Ferrari ever since last year's Austrian Grand Prix, like you mentioned, Ruby. Last Charles Leclerc victory, Carlos Sainz won the British Grand Prix. So they're they're almost a year now without a victory at all. So you know it, it's it's just pain for Ferrari fans, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And if you've been looking at my notes, because you've mentioned basically all of my talking points for the next two teams. Um, but anyway, moving on, uh, Tom, the Aston Martin team have a fight on their hands to recover P2 in the constructors. Only one of their drivers able to consistently bring out the pace of their car. Um, but they are currently sat in P3. Fernando Alonso said in Canada, it was like having to deliver 70 quali laps to keep ahead of the Mercedes of Lewis Hamilton. Is that fight set to continue in Austria? I hope so, because I really like seeing those who go toe to toe. Um you know, I, I'm I'm not particularly, you know, like for or against either driver, um, and it, it's just, you know, it, it's it's just enjoy. It's it's just so pleasing watching them battle. You know, for you know P two or you know P three or whatever position they're fighting for, because you know, Alonso, you know, he 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 could hold a grudge with uh, with a raindrop for getting in his eye in two thousand and three. So, you know, so obviously he's going to hold a grudge with Hamilton, who beat him in equal machinery in 2007, like Nico Rosberg did in equal machinery in 2016. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, Alonso just, he's that, he's that bloke who, who just can't let things go. Um, and, you know, Hamilton is obviously supremely, you know, you know yeah, I've, I, everybody knows I'm not, I'm not a Hamilton fan, but you cannot deny how, how supremely talented he is. I'm watching those two elder states of the sport go at it, hammer and tong, which seems like almost week in, week out now. It is just a joy to watch, especially as you know, you know Max has settled off into the sunset, which I'm bored of already. Um, so I want to see those two just you know just going at it every, every weekend. And you know, for, for those people who were saying, you know, oh, well, Hamilton didn't mean last year he's washed up. Nah, mate, have a word to yourself. Um, he's not washed up, you know. He's still one of the best drivers on the grid, and and, and you know, watching you know 
both him and Alonso just basic. It, it's like the, it's like they have a sparring match each time. Each time they're racing each other and they're pushing each other and they're making each other better as well. I'd say because they're you know they're you know, they're just like eking out a tenth here, half a tenth there. You know, just making a little move here, a little move there, and it's it's, it's brilliant to watch. I, genuinely, I really really enjoy watching them race. It's just a shame they're not racing for P1 um, with how competitively they are racing against each other. But George, staying with the Astons and kind of continuing my question um, earlier, um, is Lance Stroll going to end up costing Aston Martin P2 in the Constructors? And does Stroll Senior need to come to a decision about the number two driver in his team? Oh, good question. I like that. Um I mean, given given his performance level to Fernando Alonso, you would have to say probably going to cost them second in the constructors. I I think that's a definite possibility. Um, you also have to consider the fact that Fernando Alonso is pretty good. You know, he's not a bad driver, as we know. <laughs> uh, I think he's driving the absolute wheels off of that car. He seems like a new man. Uh, not that he was ever bad or anything, but I mean, he was good at Alpine. But now the, the guy is just awoken. And I, I feel like he is potentially in some of the best, best form of his life. And I include his championship years in that as well. Um, I think he's driving fantastically. Um, he's third in the drivers' championship, and I think uh, I think somebody pointed out after Canada that he's uh, he's only just behind Sergio Perez as well. He could very well get second in the, in the drivers' championship by the end of the year, which for an Aston Martin team that were probably expected to be about fourth or fifth in, in the constructors is huge. Um, I'd be very interested to see what I don't know, like a Norris or an Ocon or a or even a Signs would do alongside Alonso at the moment. I think it's a, a tad harsh to say that uh, Stroll is, you know, the sole reason for them maybe not getting second in the Constructors' Championship. Um, with the second driver thing, it's a very it's a pivotal point in Aston Martin's future at the moment. Alonso's going to stay there for at least another year. There's no doubt he's going to be there next year. Does he continue after that? Given his age, you'd say probably not, but this is Alonso. Um, if he's performing like he is now next year, he can keep going. Why not? If, you, if you're good enough, you're old enough. And if you're good enough, you're young enough as well. So there's no reason why he can't keep going. But if he does go and he gets rid of Stroll, gets rid of his son from the second seat, then you've got two new drivers in the team. So it's a very, very tricky point. I think he'll keep his son around. I don't think they'll... I don't think many people want to go to Aston Martin. Is that's not a slight on Aston Martin at all? I think if you're if you're the likes of an Albon or the likes of I don't know somebody else, uh, uh, Piastri or Norris or someone like that, I don't see them going there anyway. But it, I, if you're one of those drivers and you're thinking, right, I'm doing really well at the moment, and then you get put in the car alongside Alonso and he absolutely wipes the floor with you, which is probably what would happen, it could kill your career. So I think he'll keep his son around. Whether it's the right thing for the team or not, I don't know. But I think I think Stroll will be there next year um, in the number two seat. Yeah, and that is a good point about, you know, going up against Alonso and it potentially killing your career. I mean, we've only got to look at Stoffel van Dorn or wait, no, because he's not in the sport anymore as to how much of an impact having Fernando Alonso as your teammate can be if you're not already well established, as we have seen. So Mercedes are up to P2 in the Constructors after a string of good results. And despite a retirement from George Russell, Aaron, look good for their money at the moment. P3 and P4 here last year after what was a messy weekend. Can Mercedes put themselves in contention in Austria? Yeah, I think they can because they're getting on top of their car. It's going to be a little bit more suited to their their high-speed uh, sort of preference with the car. Um, as to whether they'll be able to challenge Red Bull I doubt it there's probably still a lot they need to learn about the the change of concept uh but yeah second in sort of overall should be their target beating Aston Martin and Ferrari and beating them comfortably you know at least one car on the podium maybe two if Perez continues his erratic form you know that should be the target but operationally Mercedes are showing that they are still at least equal with Red Bull in, in that department, they are executing every race pretty much as well as they possibly can. You know, in Canada, they 
probably didn't quite have enough pace to to keep Aston Martin behind, even if they had two cars sort of pinching Alonso on strategy. So it's well well considered that they are the strongest pair of drivers on the grid. And this is a circuit I think they'll do well at. Hamilton hasn't necessarily had as much success here as he has relative to other places, only the two victories, um, but quite a few pole positions, actually. He got beaten off the line in a couple of those. So it's not like he he's not very good round here, but it's just not one of his strongest circuits. And everyone's allowed to have one of those. Russell, he needs to just keep it tidy this weekend, make sure he doesn't throw it out of the wall. Um, but thankfully, they're a little bit further away this week. So, uh, yeah, we should all be finding that fine and dandy. Definitely. Tom, we've been told to expect two major upgrades to the Mercedes package before the mid-season break. They're bringing one set of upgrades to Silverson and reportedly one set in Belgium. Uh, considering that they have a year of uh, side pod development to catch up on, uh, would you say this is the right idea from the team who want to put themselves back in the uh, uh, championship contention? There we go. Well, that way. Um Yes, uh, you know, given that you know we just just spoke about Stroll and potentially costing uh, Aston Martin P two in in the constructors, um, Mercedes are absolutely right to you know sort of realise. Oh, hang on, you know, it's like oh well, who'd have thought it putting side pods on a car? You know, blow me down. The car goes fast. Cargo burr. You know, so it's uh, it, it's um. It, I'm glad that they've realised. I uh, say, I say, I'm glad. I'm not, but, uh, but you know, it, it's good for the team that they've realised now that you know, that whilst on paper the zero side pods concepts, you know, was theoretically faster in practice and in reality it wasn't. And they've gone, okay, look, we tried it, give another chance, it hasn't worked. Put side pods on, and what do you know? Um, I think, especially given you know how close they were to Aston. In Canada, even before they'd um, even before they'd had a chance to do more development or more sort of you know R and D or what have you on on the car with you know, with their side pods, they've got a really good chance of, of getting P two. And if they can get one up on Aston Martin now, you know I say now is in before the summer break. Um, it's uh, you know it's it's um, it's it's. It, it, it's, it can only be good for them and given they had such a sort of up and down season last year which I don't think it's as bad as people made doubt it was let's not forget they did you know, you know they did pretty much dominate the, the races in, in Brazil last year um, you know the, you know the Mercedes are in a fairly good spot they're not going to catch Red Bull nobody's going to catch Red Bull this year as much as people don't want to hear it, it, it it's just not going to happen because that Red Bull is a rocket ship um, but they have a really good chance of taking P2 in the constructors and they're, they're right to bring the upgrades and sort of just go at it hammer and tong now yeah, certainly. So, George, that just leaves the Red Bull in P1 and the inevitable Max Verstappen could be winning the Constructors by himself with his underperforming team, mate. 321 points for the team, Verstappen on 195 and Perez on 126. They're both P1 and 2 in the Drivers' Championship. Um, but with the consistent results from Alonso and Hamilton, the gap has closed to Perez significantly over recent weeks. What does the Mexican driver have to do to put his car where it belongs? He just needs a clean weekend, which for one reason or another, he's not had in a while. I mean, I'm looking at his results in the last three races, 16 for Monaco, fourth in Spain, sixth in Canada, um, which for a car that is absolutely miles clear of everybody else is simply not good enough. And listen, I love Perez. I think he's great. I've always waxed lyrical about the guy, but he's just he's just not been on it this season, or at least he's not been on it recently anyway. And I think that's a shame for him. I really do, because I think it's going to tarnish his legacy because he should go down as a pretty decent driver. Not a championship, a driver that's able to win the championship or anything, but at the very least, an amazing number two driver at a top team or an incredible driver at a midfield team like he was at Force India and Racing Point. Um so he just needs a clean weekend, simple as that. Um, unfortunately, over the years, he's not really had that much at Austria. Uh, I think he, he could have won in 2020. I don't know where it was Austria or Austria, one of the races of that track. 
Uh, he could have won in the race in point that year, but had contact and it just didn't work out for him. It's not a great track for him. And like you rightfully point out as well, Alonso and Hamilton are breathing down his neck. He could very well find himself in P4 in the driver's standings after this weekend or the next weekend at Silverstone. Um, and then, I mean, we asked, we, you know, we spoke about Aston Martin. What do they do with their second driver? What do Red Bull do with their second driver? Do they keep him round? I think they should. I think they should, to be honest. I don't see anybody who's a very willing replacement for him. The likes of Albon and Gasly will never come back. Um, and Sonoda and De Vries are just, they're not there. They're not good enough. Simple as that. They've not been shown they deserve to be in that team. So I think Perez will stick around, but the pressure's going to be on the guy. He's got to get at least a second place very soon. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's been said many times now that that car should be in P2 in a normal race weekend. Um, but it just hasn't been because it, Sergio Perez hasn't been driving normal race weekends. Aaron, Verstappen has won four of the last seven races at this circuit, if you include the results of the Styrian Grand Prix. Um, considering his form as of late, would it be silly to expect anything other than total domination across the whole weekend? Uh, no, it wouldn't. But uh, F1 has a funny way of, you know, just random engines going pop in in weird places to end these streaks of dominance you know we saw it with mercedes back at the, the height of their heyday their drivers would crash into each other verstappen hasn't got quite that but you know stranger things do happen in formula one so always beware the reliability um red bull have been very good with reliability this year i'm not is it their powertrain is it on the powertrain who knows um yeah i think we should expect max to come and deliver he's he's very good around this circuit historically. Although last year he didn't he didn't do so well. So um they they might struggle a little bit sort of early on in like qualifying, getting heat in the front tires. That's that's been a problem for them. So I'll wait and see how that pans out. If they don't have track position, then that could be quite interesting because it is a short lap and it would take quite some effort to get out of one second of DRS. And I believe in the sprint they activate DRS. Uh, after one lap, I think that's where they're trialing it. So that could be quite interesting with three DRS zones. Even if he does get into the lead, he's got to put on you know a real burst of speed in the opening lap and use those tires. So who knows? It could it could come back to bite him because of the, the layout of the track. But honestly, I don't see anything other than Max Verstappen on pole on Friday, Max Verstappen on pole on Saturday, Max Verstappen winning the sprint on Sunday, and Max Verstappen winning sorry, winning the sprint on Saturday, and Max Verstappen winning the Grand Prix on Sunday. So yeah, he'll win he'll win Silverstone, he'll win Hungary, he'll win Belgium, he'll win Monza and all of the others. So yeah, um, no one else is ever going to win a Formula One race. In the future history of F1. Uh, Tom, we saw it with Vettel, now we're seeing it with Stappen. This is just what happens when a constructor and driver are working perfectly in harmony with each other. Aaron's already said no one else is going to win. How long can this winning streak last? Uh, this season and next season, I'd say, because Red Bull are already working on next year's car. Um, you know, because they don't need to develop this year's car that much more. They've got the drivers and constructors sewn up. You said it yourself earlier, Max can win it by himself, you know, which is just insane. And yes, it's not good entertainment to see it, but F1 is the pinnacle of motorsport and it's the pinnacle of research and development and technology and catering and everything else that, that, that goes into it. Yes, I'm making jokes about that. Um, it, you know, and you know, we saw it with we saw it with Seb in you know in 2010, 2013. We saw it with Hamilton, you know, you know, 2017 onwards, and you know even before then when he was battling with with Rosberg, you know, the two of them. Um, and you know, we saw it with Schumacher. We saw it, you know, we, we, we've we've seen it throughout the history of F1, and and it is just part of what F1 is, and it, you know, it's part of what makes the sport the sport, you know, because the. The uh, you know people were saying the RB18 was going to go down as one of the best F1 cars. The RB19 is like sunshine. Hold my beer, get in my shadow because it's even quicker, and you know it's just it's picked up on the flaws that the RB18 had, and it's just you know it's it's just it's just even better still. So could we see another driver win a race this season? I think we heard. You know, I I, I think you know if. You know, but the the problem is you've got to look at it and you've got to think 
where would it be? Because the one time this season when Max even had a remote threat of a driver, you know, sort of like sniffing a win out of him, aside from, you know, so we had Baku where Perez was quicker, and even before the safety car and everything that happened, Perez was going to be taking the lead, and we then have one of the dullest races we've had for for quite a while. Um, the, the one that really springs to mind is Monaco, when Alonso went to two purple sectors in quality, then only did the green final sector, and Max put the timing where it mattered. Um, and then, you know, Red Bull then also held the strategy. Because we've seen with, with Red Bull, they've got the reliability now. They've got the they've got they've got the, the low speed corners, they've got the medium speed corners, they've got the high speed corners. They've got look how ridiculously powerful the DRS is on that car. You know. You know, there's that. They've got the reliability. They've got the strategy. You know, Hannah Schmitz is doing absolute wonders on, on that pit wall. You know, absolutely nailing strategy week in, week out. Now, I bet she has Ferrari on the phone, you know, every other week saying, oh, Hannah, how do you do that, mate? You know, just like, you know, can you give us some pointers? And it's like, you know, clue is listen to your drivers. So, yeah, it's just, I appreciate I've just watched the lyrical about Red Bull. Can you play me, really? Um, and if you do, I don't care. Um, yeah. So uh, you, you know, you know, the, the, it's, nothing is really going to stop the Red Bull Dragon up this year. They might have a couple of chinks in the armor, but yeah, they're going to walk away with it. And I think next year, the onus is on the other teams to catch up, which I think will happen. And I think Mercedes will probably be the biggest threat next year. I mean, the onus is always on the other teams to catch up. We can't be asking for, you know, instruction to come from on high to affect things, you know, like 2013 or um, 2018, 2019, all those other seasons where mid-season, uh, like, regulations played a part. Um, but, you know, it, the onus is on the other teams to win. Um, and currently they have yet to do so. Uh, but looking at some predictions then for this Austrian sprint race weekend, George, I'll start with you. Firstly, what's your podium prediction for the race? Who will win the sprint and who ends up on pole position on Friday? I think it's going to be another clean sweep for Verstappen. to be honest with you. I can see him getting pole, sprint win, race win. I think I think the, gla- the gap is potentially going to close long term, like Tom was alluding to there. I think uh, I think Mercedes have definitely got an advantage in that because of the wind all the time and all things like that. Um, but I don't think that's quite at this time. Uh, you know, uh, Alonso got closer to Verstappen in Canada, but I also think it was maybe a bit like when a cat plays his mouse before it before it goes and swoops in. It was just Verstappen was just kind of playing with everybody, giving him some sort of hope, but he wasn't really there. Um, so I think Verstappen will take the lot, to be honest. Um, second place, um, I think probably Alonso again. I see that. And I think third... I'm going to go with Russell for a better week, and obviously had his great trouble in Canada. Um, but, but yeah, um, I think I think he'll get. I think he'll get on the podium. I think he'll have a better weekend, partly because Hamilton doesn't do particularly well by it, around here by his standards. Um, it's not his favourite track, so those are my those are my predictions. Verstappen across the board, Hamilton, uh, Alonso, and then Russell. Um, Aaron, your uh, podium sprint winner and pole sitter predictions, please. Uh, yeah, I concur. It's going to be a Verstappen clean sweep, barring uh, the potential thunderstorms and rain that could blow him off course. Uh, second and third, I, I'm going to go Hamilton second, um, and I'm going to go for Alonso third. And they're going to have another race-long battle as well. And uh, honestly, I've, I haven't got Perez on the podium because I just don't know what Checo is going to turn up with this week in qualifying. He hasn't made Q3 for the last three races in a row um and Verstappen has led every race uh, every lap of every race since Miami so good luck Checo <laughs> that's all I can say I mean you're not wrong there Aaron uh finally Tom your podium sprint winner and pole sitter predictions please uh I mean it's hard to not say a match clean sweep um you know he's a uh... Yeah, I, I I think he's, he's going to get pole, he's going to get a sprint pole, he's going to win the sprint, he's going to win the race. Um, I'd probably go as far to say he's going to bleed every lap and get the fastest lap, honestly. It, it, it is hard to see. Actually, no, I'm not going to say fastest laps. I think somebody in the DRS stream might go. I completely zoned out. Did you say your podium prediction? 
No, I didn't because I zoned out as well. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm so glad we're, we're all in sync on this podcast. Um, no, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, my podium. Yeah, no, I'm 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 going to say, but uh, Max, um, I am going to say, uh, I'm not going to say Checo because I agree with what Aaron said. Where he's just you don't know who's going to turn up. Um, you know, I th- I think the um. I th- <laughs> I think the Mexican uh, Ministry of Defence is closed for the time being. Um, or maybe they're on strike, who knows. Um, P2, I'm going to say... Um, oh, yeah, I'm going to say Alonso. Yeah, um, you know. And then I think he and Hamilton are going to have another good battle, so I'm going to go with... Boy, and I'm going to go the same podium as Canada, so um, the Alon Ham. There, Alon Ham. Uh, so thinking about bolder predictions and something a lot less likely to happen, George, what are you gambling on? I'm going to go for Albon for the points again. I guess with what happened a week ago, it's not that bold of a prediction, but I would like to see the Williams uh, put the cat amongst the pigeons, as it were, and uh, probably put some pressure on my team McLaren if they get another good hole of points, which I don't really want to see, but from an entertainment point of view, makes it a bit better. If there's one thing that's consistent in grid talk, it's George's bold predictions of a Williams getting points um, and then it not happening. Uh, Aaron, your bold <laughs> prediction, please. Uh, mine also is it's kind of bold, but it's not kind of bold, if that makes sense. Uh, you will understand in a moment. Uh, so I think Mercedes are going to get a car on the front row at some point. So that's going to cover. I'm covering my bases with sprint and Grand Prix qualifying for that. So uh yeah, I mean, Lewis Hamilton has just a few pole positions and George Russell has one as well. So they've got a fair few pole positions between them. So they're, they're, I think the Mercedes will do all right in qualifying. It's just whether they they get the tyres in the window. That's that's the, the key for them. If they struggle get, getting heat into the tyres, then they'll they'll be slightly off the pace. But if they can... The thing is, with, with, with it being a short lap, you can do multiple laps. So they can build up the pace and then... Uh, if they time it right, be last one last one over the line. Yeah, absolutely. And Tom, your bold prediction, please. Um. Oh, what's his name? He tries for uh, uh, Nick De Vries gets a point. I mean, so far he's pointless, so that would be a bold prediction. Yeah, and he hasn't got any points in F one. Exactly, and um, I homonyms um anyway at that point that's the weekend all previewed so now it's a chance to give people an opportunity to do a bit of self-promotion um or promoting something a bit of a plug george you're a co- your grid talk co-host is there anything you'd like to plug at the minute yeah absolutely if you guys want to see my uh, opinions on everything football you can head over to the football chronicle that's footballchronicle.com uh f-u-t-b-o-l uh, I usually do a weekly opinion piece on the world of football, but at the moment it's the off season. So there's not really that much to talk about other than a certain country buying every player out there for ridiculous sums of money. But I don't really want to give too much of a spotlight on that because it's just a bit frustrating. But uh, yeah, so you can head over to there. And of course, you can catch us at Grid Talk Live this weekend coming up, like Ruby said at the top of the show as well. Absolutely. Aaron, AHGP, give us the rundown. Uh, so AHGP is my YouTube channel podcast thing uh, where I spout more opinions about motorsport. Usually, well, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. Uh, my predictions this year have generally been quite good. So uh, it's been a quite a, a good recipe of pick Red Bull and then the most likely uh, contender to finish third, usually Alonso or Hamilton. Uh, but I do driver ratings after each race. Uh, so I rate everyone out of five. Uh, I do my post-race thoughts i have shorts i use a wheel spinner to predict the podium uh the most recent one had hulkenberg in second uh it kind of got something right there so maybe the wheel does know something um, but yeah there's a variety of different things i talk indycar i talk formula e so formula e watch alongs are coming back when there are a more sociable hour and i'm in the country so <laughs> Yeah, lots to look forward to on my channel. Uh, come and give me a sub or at least something. Just come and say hello. I'm at 269 subscribers. So uh, if you want to help me get to 300, do so, please. Yeah, absolutely. Go and give it a follow. And Tom Downey, as well as being a Grid Talk co-host, you also co-host Formula Talk. Why not give us a rundown of that? 
I do indeed. So, former the Talkback co-host um, alongside Sophia, who was the brainchild of, of the show, um, we look at F2, F3, F1 Academy. Um, we have also touched on things like IndyCar, Le Mans. Um, however, if we were to try and do every single non F1 racing series that exists, I don't think I'd ever sleep or blink. Um, so we do focus mainly on F2, F3 and F1 Academy as they are obviously the direct support series to F1. Um, that gets recorded weekly, although we have had a week off uh, this week, so we're going to be recording next week, uh, I think tomorrow actually, and we could be previewing Austria. Yeah, and if you want to hear anything more from me, I am obviously um, one of the main hosts of the show. You can hear us in our back catalogue. If you want to find me on the socials, it's at Rubes, R-U-U-B-E-Z. Put a 001 on Instagram. But also, like George plugged, and like I said at the start of the show, come and see us at Grid Talk Live. If you're in Manchester on Sunday, the 2nd of July, we'll be at Seven Oaks, um, the postcode M14HL. Um, but if you can't make it down, we will be live streaming as usual. But Grid Talk is available on YouTube where most episodes are recorded live, as well as Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal and Pocket Casts. Just search Formula on Grid Talk for our huge back catalogue of shows with previews and reactions to qualifying and the race results. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon so you can get mics, lights and better recording equipment. And also make sure you subscribe to the first know when each new episode is released. We'll be back soon to, with plenty Plenty more F1 content. Thank you very much for listening to the Grid Talk podcast presented by Bet Online, and goodbye.